Welcome to the Ellen Conspiracy. This video will be somewhat different from the others. This is less about theories and evidence than it is about analyzing the world building of Elden Ring when it comes to the subject of religion. In this video, I will attempt to analyze the beliefs and ideas of the Erdtree Order religion in the fictional world of Elden Ring. The first thing that comes to mind when seeing the symbols and iconography of the Erdtree is the pantheistic religion of the ancient Norse. While the concept of a giant tree, Yggdrasil, certainly comes from ancient Norse myth, the overall structure and organization is clearly inspired by Christianity. And it's this comparison between the Erdtree Order and Christianity I will be focusing on in this video. If we analyze what the followers of the Erdtree religion actually believe, we find something completely different. While the religion of America and the Erdtree appears Christian, the ideas they espouse are entirely new. At this point, I should offer a disclaimer. I am not a religious person, and I was not raised in a religious household. All the knowledge I have of Christianity and other organized religions is strictly from an outsider's perspective. The religion of Christianity has many denominations. What I'm trying to get at here is a more general outlook. Spiritual traditions in our society serve many purposes, but the one I will focus on first is morality. That is, how a religion talks about right or wrong action and what ultimately is the source of evil in the universe. In the religion of Christianity, one must believe that the God of Abraham is the creator of the universe, that he sent his only child, Jesus, to earth, and that Jesus gave his life for the redemption of mankind. In order to be worthy of God's love, one must accept Jesus Christ as their savior, believe that he died on the cross and was resurrected, as well as follow the Ten Commandments. There may be other rules, depending on the denomination. In Christianity, the basis of morality is the individual's conduct with respect to God's will. One becomes sinful through their own actions. Even if one has committed a sin, they can still be forgiven by God if they properly atone. Sin is possible as a result of free will granted by God, who created everyone and everything. All things are all subject to the authority of God. In the Erdtree religion, there are no Ten Commandments, and there is no divine will, at least none that can be at all explicated. One must believe that the Erdtree is the eternal wellspring of all life, the anchor of all lands, etc. In this respect, the basis of morality is the individual's conduct with respect to the perceived health and well-being of the Erdtree. In other words, the basis of morality is environmental. All things and people the Erdtree Order considers sinful are all seen as signs of the Erdtree's perceived impurity and degradation. Those who live in death, the omens and the misbegotten, all trace their origins back to the Erdtree. And yet the Erdtree Order under Merica sees them as heralds of an encroaching disease, which must be eliminated for the Erdtree to thrive. In this way, a being can be sinful to the Order by its very nature, regardless of individual conduct there is no possibility of redemption. If one truly believed that the Erd Tree was the source of all life, then artificial forms of life must also be sinful. The Albanorix, Clockwork Soldiers, and Crystallians are all described as created by means other than the Erd Tree, and they are likewise shunned. Even though the Nightfolk preset hints at the possibility of someone who once bled silver to become worthy of grace. If you subscribe to the idea of Erdtree birth, the theory that most people in the lands between were born directly from the Erdtree or similar trees, then it makes sense that sexual reproduction would be frowned upon as well, as that would upset the monopoly the Erdtree must have on all life. In the Erdtree order, sin is situated in the body, or the environment, not necessarily in one's thoughts or actions. Those who are considered good or saintly to the Erdtree order are people like the perfumers, they are both priests and botanists who partake in the divine practice of cultivation by which the minor herb trees can flourish. Martyrdom is an important virtue in Christianity. The idea of sacrificing one's life for the propagation of the faith is a recurring theme in the stories of early Christian cultures. The primary example is that of Jesus himself. Then there are the myriad saints in the Catholic tradition who gave their lives instead of renouncing their faith in God. 
The Erdtree Order of the Lands Between does not have a similar concept of martyrdom. From what little we know, sacrifice for the faith is not seen as a virtue in and of itself. We do hear of champions who died after fulfilling their purpose. We also hear from America that anyone who does not become a lord or god will be sacrifices. But this is not seen as holy, rather seems like a cold, calculating way of disposing of the unwanted, as we see with the Jar people. No one knows who is inside the Jar warriors. We have some inkling that they must contain generations of champions, but we aren't really sure. Something tells me the sacrifice of these champions in defense of the Urn Tree isn't much appreciated. The goal of the Tarnished involves burning the Erd Tree, which requires the sacrifice of a kindling maiden. But this is not part of the Erd Tree religion. Rather, it is in service of natural forces outside the purview of the Erd Tree and the Elden Ring. The event itself is considered a cardinal sin in the eyes of the Church. The Erd Tree religion as a whole seems to deny death as a concept. The Golden Order began when the Rune of Dust and Death was sealed. The burning of the Erd Tree, which has been glimpsed in prophecy, is denied by the Church. So what meaning would martyrdom have in this system? The world of Elden Ring does have an analog to the God of Abraham depicted in the Bible, except the greater will does not make its will known in the same way. There are no tablets handed down to Moses. There are no prophets receiving the word of God directly as we read about in the Bible. The system of finger readers interpreting the words of the fingers who somehow get communication from the greater will is a far more indeterminate system, especially when we see that the fingers have motives of their own, which may or may not be part of the greater will's plan. It is meant to cast doubt on the greater will itself. As I covered in the last video, the Two Fingers Faithful is actually at odds with the other religious organizations. In the Gospels of Jesus Christ, there is the story of Jesus being questioned by Pharisees who were attempting to find out his stance on taxation. They asked him whether it was lawful for the Jews to pay taxes and hoped that he would publicly oppose taxation, therefore making him an enemy of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. To their surprise, Jesus gave the famous quote, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. Jesus was not opposed to Jews paying taxes to the Romans. This has been interpreted as Jesus making a clear statement that Christianity is flexible enough to exist within a secular society though this doesn't mean it's opposed to theocracy either. Contrast this with the way religion is treated in Elden Ring. The Erdtree Order and the wider Church of America is essentially a state religion. America is both God and Queen. The seat of government is also the seat of religion. Secularism doesn't have any meaning here. The perfumers are Erdtree priests, but also nobles and leaders in times of war. With regards to secularism, Roger talks about how the Erdtree religion of the past was flexible enough to incorporate other faiths, such as the dragon cult of Laindel, or the worship of the moon when Ranala and Radagon were wed. However, it's hard to know whether this was true neutrality under the law or a kind of religious conquest. As Roger says, the Golden Order of today makes no such concessions. A big part of Christianity and other religions is how they deal with the concept of death. All of us are going to die someday, and this creates a profound anxiety. Many spiritual traditions have dealt with this anxiety by creating myths about the immortal soul, an individual's eternal spiritual essence, which lives on after their physical body has died. This concept is always linked to moral judgments, as the ultimate fate of one's soul depends on the moral character of one's life. A paradise is reserved to those who are virtuous, and a bland purgatory or tortuous hell awaits the others. These stories contextualize one's life on earth as a preparation for an eternal afterlife. Elden Ring's world is more obscure in this regard. Living beings do have souls, and spirits are seen taking actions on their own without any physical body. But there is no talk of heaven or hell, or any afterlife in particular. The theme of resurrection is very common in Elden Ring. The Tarnished themselves are said to rise from the grave because of the grace granted to them. The followers of the Twin Bird, as well as the Eclipse of Castle Soul, await a distant resurrection. To have grace means, broadly, that one is favored by the powers that be. The benefits include resurrection and an ephemeral kind of guidance. 
which can be lost. But this grace is contingent upon completing a certain goal. Others see it as a burden that has been thrust upon the tarnished. Followers of modern religion sometimes experience a divine calling, that God wants them to take on a certain career or life goal. Grace seems to be a very literal interpretation of this kind of religious experience. Followers of the Erd Tree Order practice a kind of faith in grace, that they act on the Erd Tree's behalf, not knowing if they will receive grace or not, and hoping for resurrection, not knowing if it will come. Perhaps the reason no one talks about an afterlife in the Lands Between is because the Lands Between is itself an afterlife. This is a theory that has been talked about since the game's release. All Tarnished died in some place outside the Lands Between before being reborn there. The Lands Between could be the ultimate destination of the souls of champions. It also vastly complicates the idea of the immortal soul. If everyone inhabiting the Lands Between died in some other place or time, what does it mean for them to inhabit a physical body here? Wouldn't everything be spirit? It's likely I'm thinking too much into this. The Lands Between shows a vast amount of evidence that it has been inhabited for millennia. It's hard to conceptualize how an afterlife could have its own native civilizations. The age of the Erd Tree began amongst conflict. As such, the foundational narratives of the Erd Tree Order are stories of military conquest. In this early time, the warriors of the Erd Tree made their weapons directly from its wood. The blessings of the Erd Tree were palpable and certain. However, this age of plenty would come to a close. For many difficult to establish reasons, the Erd Tree began to die, and the blessings became less frequent, less certain. It used to be that the roots of the catacombs connected to those of the Erd Tree, allowing souls to return, but no longer. What used to be certain must now be taken on faith. If the blessings don't come, they must be earned with the power of faith. And now we come to the Golden Order, in which the sacred Erd Tree and its blessings became abstractions. The blessings are a distant memory. Now we must find out what the Erd Tree can tell us about the universe. We must be willing to study the Erd Tree and not shrink away from what we find. People still remember the bounty of the Golden Age, and the Golden Order is, for many, a religion founded on faith in the past, that perhaps the blessings of the Erd Tree could come again, that if we work hard enough, things could be just as they were, forever. While many religions in the actual world focus on future salvation, the Erd Tree religion is rooted in nostalgia. Even though we can say that the Erd Tree religion isn't heavily Christian-inspired in its ideas, it plays the same role in the story that a monotheistic religion would in a medieval history-inspired narrative, that is, as a representation of the dominant society, that which promises a paradise on earth and declares itself to be a herald of divine mandate. Thus, the Erd Tree Order has crusaders who fight for it and heathens who oppose it. But the Erd Tree Order is also completely unique to the world it inhabits and attempts to describe. It's interesting to think how a religion can function in a fantasy world where dragons and miracles and demons actually exist. Even though fantastical creatures and magic exist, that doesn't mean the world lacks mysteries to interpret or reasons to have faith. This has been the Elden Conspiracy, signing out.